Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I'm going to fix a fault that this computer has here. This is my TRACD Model 3, which you may have noticed floating around in the background of some of my recent videos, and that's because this machine's had a problem with it actually for the last few months, and I brought it down here to the basement to, well, to fix it, and I just haven't gotten around to it. So today's the day I'm going to actually repair this machine. And in case you think this is just another Tandy TRS-80 video, it's actually not because the problem with this machine is with the floppy drive here, and that's just a normal floppy drive that could be on any old vintage computer. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Let me first touch on a little bit of the background of this particular computer. It is just a normal TRS-80 Model 3 48K double disk drives. It's pretty much bone stock as far as Model 3s go. It doesn't have anything fancy going on. Now I actually put this computer together and this is an amalgamation of two different machines before I was doing regular retro computer YouTube videos. I think I had actually made a few videos at that point when I got this machine, but I was really, well, I had a tiny little channel that no one was watching, and this was one of the earliest retro computers that I got. Now, as you can see, if you know these machines, this machine is in really good shape. It's very typical for there to be wear right here on the painted surface from people typing on the keyboard. And as you can see, this one doesn't have any of that wear. There are a few scuffs and scratches on this machine, but overall it's in really good shape. Most of what you see here on the bench started its life as a 16K cassette only machine. So it had no floppy drives, just had blank plates in the two positions. The computer was really, really dirty when I got it. And while it turned on, it actually didn't work. It would just have corruption or garbage on the screen. I had tried to repair the motherboard with my very limited skills at the time. And that recent TRS-80 Model 3 motherboard repair video I made was actually the original motherboard from this that I was repairing and finally did get working. The way this computer ended up with a working motherboard and double floppy drives is I found someone selling a broken and very, very worn out and tired TRS-80 Model 3. And I think I paid $15 for it. Combining the parts from that parts machine with the now cleaned up and cosmetically really nice condition cassette only machine that I had bought made this computer as you see here. After putting this computer together, because I feel that like this particular specimen and the TRC Model 3 in general is just such an incredible iconic looking computer, I actually keep this upstairs and I periodically use it. Well, a few months ago I went to go use it and I went to stick a boot disc in there and lo and behold, there's something wrong on the disk drive here. Now the two floppy drives that the TRS-80 Model 3 uses are just Sugart standard floppy drives, like a PC floppy drive. I think the stock machine had single-sided drives and I don't even remember what's inside of here. If you're wondering about this toggle switch, this was installed on the drive before I got it and all it seems to do is intercept the write protect signal to either allow it to pass through in the middle position or force the drive to always be write protected or force it to always be write enabled. As far as the problem with this drive, you could see that, well, it's not supposed to be kind of like this. This front lever is no longer connected to the clamping mechanism that clamps the disc inside the drive. The way it's supposed to work is like this, where you push up here and it actually raises and lowers the entire clamping mechanism and you can close it properly. It turns out that this broken lever here is incredibly common for this particular kind of drive, which happens to be a tandem drive. If you have a vintage computer that includes any that uses these full height drives, if you haven't already had this happen to yours, it's probably going to happen at some point in the future. It's just a flaw in the design. Luckily, the community has come through and a replacement part that you can 3D print yourself is available to get these drives working. So let me open this computer and pull this drive out and let's take a look at what broke and let's get this drive fixed. Alrighty, I have the drive out of the computer. It's this one right here. And I also brought out some other five and a quarter inch full high drives. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that you might notice that all of these seem to look roughly identical on the front. I mean, ignoring the Apple drive here, which actually has a metal sticker applied to the front of the drive. While they all look the same, they're not all created the same. Now, focusing specifically on this Apple II disk drive, the original Apple II disk drive that came out, I think it was in 1978 or 79, 
was based on the Sugart SA390 drive mechanism. And the lore goes that the original SA400, which was the original full height five and a quarter inch disc drives invented by Sugart Associates, was too expensive. So we asked Sugar to send over some of their mechanisms minus the drive electronics, and he went ahead and designed his own drive electronics. And if you just look at the original board here on this drive, it's way simpler than say the one on this one. There's just a lot more going on here. And this is a very elegant and simple design. Now the lore is, I don't know if this is true or not, that Sugar actually sent over broken mechanisms or ones that were underperforming and Waz was still able to make them work and he created the original Apple II disk drive system. All these other mechanisms that basically look, <laughs> they look almost identical, are actually clones of the original SA400 drive. Now the one on the right here, the one that's broken now, is the Tandon TM100. And you can see the model number right there. The original SA400 was also single sided and 48 tracks per inch, as is the Apple drive right here. Then this one here, let's see, who makes this one? Ah, this is another Tandon here. It's another TM100-1A. Now the interesting thing about this drive and the one for the TRS-80 that I, well, at least the one I was using on the TRS-80, as you can see, this has two read-write head assemblies. So there are two connectors here and they're both connected. So this is a double-sided drive. Looking here at this drive, not only is the PCB a different color, but you can see that only one of the read-write heads is connected. It's actually kind of amusing to me that all of the electronics is in place for a double-sided drive, but there's just physically no second head on this particular disk drive. And if we look at this last mechanism here, you can see the underside, it looks similar, but does look different. You can see the stepper motor is mounted this way, uh, it must have some kind of a gear drive or something. Meanwhile, on the tandem drives, the motor is mounted this way and there's like a metal belt that moves the head back and forth. But otherwise, it's pretty similar looking, and uh, the manufacturer of this, well, it says micro peripherals, MPIO. And looking at the PCB, it's obviously a simplified design. It is double-sided. There are two read-write heads there, but they sort of condensed some of the electronics down to be a bit smaller. I want to also point out this sticker that's on the spindle, and it's on almost all of these drives. Let's see if it's on all of them. So it's on the Tandon drive, it's on the Apple II drive. I mean, it's a different size sticker, but it's all the same. What this lets you do is set the speed of the drive without using any special software. You start the spindle and you point the light at this like a neon lamp that is essentially flickering at line frequency. And since line frequency, well, pretty much everywhere in the world, is a very stable 50 or 60 hertz, when this is spinning at the exact 300 RPM that the drive is designed to run at, then basically you'll see what looks like lines that aren't moving. If you adjust the speed a little too fast or too slow, then the line pattern that you're gonna see is gonna start to move one direction or the other. This works exactly the same way as a little pattern you'll see on the edge of a record player turntable that has a little neon light hooked up to mains that will allow you to dial in the exact 33 and a third or 45 RPM. So the reason why I brought out all these drives is I wanted to point out that the flaw that exists in the tandem drives that results in this broken lever here is not present on all of these. Let's start by taking a look at what broke on this tandem drive and comparing it to these other mechanisms. So looking inside the mechanism, you'll see that this lever here, it's got a brass rod on it. It was held onto the clamp with this piece of plastic here, which has these little, I don't know what they're called, like little grabbers basically, that the rod was threaded through. And over time, these little grabbers or the little claws, it's like a little C thing, get weak and they break. And then what happens is the lever becomes disconnected like this and is no longer able to clamp the disc. You can't use the drive anymore because it's actually this little lever that slides in a track that holds down the clamp. Now let's look at the other tandem drive, which incidentally is actually working still. So we open this up and yeah, what's normal by the way on tandem drives is it has a sticker here that says 48 track per inch. I don't know why the other one is missing that, but it is. This Tandon TM100 is a lot more typical because you can see instead of a brass rod, there's actually these little nylon pegs. And that is all the disc clamp, well the piece of plastic here, there and there holds onto. It is absolutely positively only a matter of time before this little C clamp thing breaks and then this drive suffers the same fate as that other drive. I can't remember how many TM100 drives I've had break, but it's a good number of them. And they're very, very common drives. They were in use across many different systems. In fact, they were one of IBM's partners for the original 5150 and 5160. 
And the tandem drives that they made for IBM had IBM's logo embossed, maybe it was down here or in one of the corners of the faceplate. But the rest of the mechanism itself is exactly like this. It's just a regular TM100 and it's going to suffer that same breakage. Now let's take a look at this Apple drive, which is like a clone of the SA400. We can see that the latch here looks a little bit more robust. I have a good number of these Apple disk drives and I never had one with a broken latch, at least where that part of it broke. And I have a few SA400s and I've never had one of those break either. So I have to think the fact that it actually loops all the way around the little peg that is attached to the latch here means that it's a lot stronger. And then let's take a look at the MPIO drive, the last one I happen just to have handy. And we can see that this looks, wow, totally different. It looks like it's got a metal rod that goes in there. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know how reliable this particular one is. I don't have a lot of these drives, but I can imagine that because it's got that same sort of C mechanism right there, that it could possibly break. Although, no, maybe, no, 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 actually, that is actually continuous there. So that loops all the way around. So this, this should be a better design mechanism as well. Looking at this sideways, I have a feeling that this pin that's in here probably goes all the way through. Let's see. Oh yeah, I can see it back there. So you, to get this apart, you probably just have to push that pin through all the way, and then you can remove the lever here. Now, most TRS-80s actually don't have tandem drives from the factory. I, I don't think they do. Maybe the early ones did, but I think that most of the later ones at least had Texas peripheral disk drives, which again was just a clone of the SA400, but it was made by a local company there in Texas. And I'm really not familiar if those have the same weakness as the tandem drives, now, earlier in the video, I had mentioned that the community has come through and created a replacement part to fix these Tandon drives. And all you have to do is go to Thingiverse and type in Tandon, and right away, stuff is gonna come up to repair the TM100. So the first item on the search results is the item we're gonna use to fix this drive, and it's the floppy door hinge. Someone has also gone since I last looked, and they have designed an replacement door as well. So it's possible that the doors break too. And the fact is that there's a replacement of those, which um, it's not gonna look the same, but it's better than a drive that doesn't work at all. Scrolling down a little further, it appears that there's also the Texas peripheral uh, latch thing. So I bet you the Texas peripheral drive suffers from the same weakness as the tandem drive. Reading the summary of the part for the Texas peripheral one, it says here, these commonly fail due to cracks breakage of the plastic pivot on the backside of the floppy door, which connects the door latch to the internal arm that clamps the disc surface. Going back to the part that I printed to repair this drive, the one for the Tandon drive, uh, let's take a look here. Also, there's actually a photograph of it installed. So there it is. And look, it's a 48 TPI drive. So that is the replacement part. The creator says that you just need to print this and then you need to go buy yourself some brass rod, 3 32nd of an inch, which I actually have here. I, have a, I bought a whole package of it actually, because <laughs> that was the cheapest way to buy it. But this brass rod is to replace those little plastic white nylon pieces that we saw on the other TM100 drive. I think the idea is the brass rod adds some more structural rigidity to the entire structure versus those little nylon pieces, which obviously have leverage when you're raising and lowering the latch that is gonna cause the side loading motion, which maybe pushes apart the C-clamp, causes it to break. I don't know, I'm no structural engineer, but I get that using something like this is gonna be better than those two nylon pieces. All right, onto the repair. This is the printed part right here. It doesn't look awesome, but to be honest, it's inside the drive and it's better than the broken latch. You have to do some disassembly of your drive to get that latch out, just the way the mechanism works here. So to do that, you just remove the uh, connector from the heads and you take out these screws here because we're gonna have to move the PCB off to the side so we can fully access the mechanism. With the screws out, you slide the PCB back. There are notches on the left and right and you just flip it over and there we go. We can see the entire mechanism on the inside. Taking a look at the disc clamp mechanism, this metal bar here is held down by these two screws, which sandwiches down the actual little piece here that attaches the front lever, and that's what's broken. So of course, we just need to take those screws out so we can get that out of the drive. So I recommend you hold the clamp underneath with your fingers. You don't wanna break it or something. And you gotta push down pretty hard on those screws because uh, of course the glue there is holding them on. All right, I'm gonna use some tweezers to get those screws out. So one and two. And then we'll get out this get out of this bar here. Oops, and it all sort of fell apart. Alrighty, the parts have been removed from the drive. So we have the two screws that were going into this middle plate here. And these little parts that drop down there are what block you from inserting a disc into the drive while there's already one in there. This is the pivot point that broke, and actually you can see this little piece that broke off right there. 
I thought that the brass rod went through there, but that's obviously incorrect. People were probably yelling at their screen. The brass rod is actually goes through the top part of the uh, door here, and that rides along a little track. So there's the brass rod right there, and it rides inside this track here. And as you open and close it, this pivots. So the front door has two pivot points in it, the brass rod that runs along this track here, along this front faceplate of the drive, and the second one, which is what's attached to the disc clamp itself. Now looking at this, I didn't even notice this, but it's actually broken right here. So the little nylon pegs, I don't admit, you know, I might've taken them out to be honest. When I first looked at this, when it broke, I took a look inside the drive with the computer fully assembled and I shone a flashlight up in there. And I think I might've reached in there with some uh, pliers or needle nose and pulled those nylon pieces out. And I don't even know where they went, but I already knew that those nylon pieces aren't useful because once this pivot point breaks, you gotta replace it with the brass rod anyways. So I have to say, I'm really glad that someone has designed a new replacement front door for this drive and I'm actually printing one as we speak because I didn't realize, but I'm gonna need to replace that along with this pivot point here. So now we just have to wait for the front door to finish printing. As you can see, it's printing away. All right, the part is off the printer and um, yeah, it looks pretty good actually. I printed it with supports, it printed on its side and uh, basically the supports were to make sure that these uh, tabs don't bend over and the part looks okay. I think it's gonna look fine on the front of the disk drive. The texture certainly doesn't match. There's the original part and you see the texture is, well, textured, <laughs> but whatever. The drive should be working and that's what's important, right? So the parts here are lined up next to each other. On the left is the original door with the broken tab and then the little, I don't know, pivot point that's broken as well. And then over here, the 3D printed versions. Now the little rod here obviously has to fit inside these tabs here. So I had to ream it out and I used um, this drill bit here. It was a 1 8 inch drill bit. And then I also used this drill bit here, which is a what, 3 32nd of an inch to ream out the holes that this uh, smaller new brass rod are gonna fit through. Now, when I cut the original brass rod, I erroneously cut it to the same length as this larger rod, but that's not correct. This one needs to be just ever so slightly wider than these two notches. Let me assemble this and you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, I've obviously gone ahead and I've trimmed the small, thinner brass rod down to length. There we go. So as you can see there, the rod is just sticking through the sides ever so slightly. There's a bit of extra clearance on the faceplate of the drive to allow it to stick out the sides a little bit. And the new 3D printed part here rotates just perfectly. So I think this is totally going to work. All right, so let me try to reassemble this. I, I'm not 100% sure of the exact steps. I think I just need to get this brass rod through here. I guess I could have uh, threaded it through outside of the drive. Okay, there we go. So I think I then put this in here because it's gonna slide in that track right there, as you see. And now we just flip down the little pivot point there and I have to get this uh, metal thing on here. So I think, let's see, let's move this out of the way. I think this goes down like this. I know it's a little hard to see, but you see there I have the tab on top of the, uh, whatever this thing is here, the clamp that is, and then the metal sits on top of that. Alrighty, the screws are installed, and I think this thing is actually working. Okay, top PCB is reinstalled. Let's see how it looks on the front. Well, I mean, it's not bad. Operation-wise, feels perfect. It's nice and smooth. Clicks into place like it should. Yeah, that's, that's working. That's pretty cool. And I'd say that it sticks out about maybe one millimeter too far forward. But I mean, when you're looking straight onto the drive, you can hardly notice it. And the drive is working. That's the most important thing. So I guess it's time to put this back in the TRS-80 Model 3 and let's see if this drive is still functional. The drive is back in the computer. I have the lid on. I haven't put the screws on yet in case I have to <laughs> take this apart because the drive doesn't work or something like that. Let's turn this on. Okay, it sounds like it's accessing, which is a good sign. 
The fact that there's nothing on screen is totally normal for these. You have to push break and reset to get to the regular basic. Now I have 13 Ghosts here, which is the game I showed off on uh, the last TRS-80 video. Oh, that's not working so well. Okay, so this doesn't close very well. Now this is not the fault of what we just 3D printed. It's the fault of how I position that little metal thing that comes down over the disc. And I see that it's hitting the floppy disk there. Should still work, maybe. It might be kind of bending the disc a little bit, but let's see. Oh, look, it's working. So, <laughs> moral of the story, when you reassemble it, stick a disc in there, open and close it, just to make sure that it's closing properly. When you loosen those two screws that are screwed into the whole clamp assembly, the little metal plate with those little prongs that come down over the disc, they can be moved around and positioned. I positioned them in a position I thought was right. Clearly not right, because it hits the disc. But there it is, the game has loaded, 13 Ghosts, excellent game and it's working. So this drive is fixed. I went into this video thinking that all I would need to do is fix that pivot point, which is why I had already printed it out and had that brass rod ready. So I was definitely surprised to find that the door was also broken on this disk drive. It really warms my heart and makes me so happy that there are members of the community out there who design replacement parts for their broken disk drives, and then they upload them to Thingiverse for other people to use. A 3D printer is becoming pretty much an invaluable thing to have if you're trying to fix and work on these old computers. I sort of alluded to the fact that the Tandon TM100 has this design flaw, but let's be honest, the drive lasted this long and it only recently broke. So it's a pretty good design, all things considered. We just know by comparison to other full height disk drives that some of the other designs seem to be a little bit more robust in the long term. What I'm probably going to do is print out a bunch of the doors and the pivot points for these tandem drives because I have at least four or five other computers that have these drives in them and I know it's just a matter of time before they break as well. So I hope you found this video interesting. Getting this old disk drive working is something I've wanted to do for a long time and I'm glad that it seems to work quite well. Well, other than the fact that I have to open it up again and fix the position of that little metal thing. Anyhow, if you like this video, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. Patrons get early access to videos, all that kind of stuff. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. Check out the second channel if you haven't already and put your comments and your questions down below. So that's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.